What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another amazing episode here on the Veteran Influencers Network. Once again, it's your boy, Chris Levine, and we are here in season four. And as always, we have a special guest. Today, we have none other than uh, Miss Liz Carmouche. Say what's up to the people. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Uh, man, this is gonna be a good one because we actually have, um, you know, a lot of past experience. It goes back at least like 15, 17 years. Um, you know, we we deployed, you know, both in the Marine Corps. She's out now, obviously. Uh, you know, we have a lot of things that we could talk about that, uh, you know, mutual things, uh, such as being in the Marine Corps and uh, mutual interest as well. But I want to go ahead and get it started. I, first of all, uh, you know, we met in the Marine Corps probably like 2005. Um, I actually and you obviously we both went to pensacola you were there a little bit longer than i was but that's where i met you at i don't know how much of that you actually remember because i know we (laughs) ended up in the same unit i'm sorry my voice is going to go in and out every once in a while so please forgive me i I try but it just stops uh but uh, yeah so we met at a school in pensacola and uh you know i got to the actually you know what you might when did you get to our unit when did you get to i got um January 2005. I got to okay, Pensacola. so I got there. Oh, wow. Okay, so you were there like a whole six months before me. So I think I hit at that peak uh, when the storm hit Pensacola. So we got stuck there and we were all on barrack support for like forever. Yeah, it, it was bad, but it's all another story. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I got to I got there in July of 2005. So you were already there for a little bit. And um, I was ordinance, you were AVI, and I don't think that our two shops, MOS-wise, was always the closest of the two. There was always, like, a few here or there, but I think we're just so far uh, apart as far as, like, what we do. So we didn't always have the, the closest of ties, but I think over time we ended up doing that. Yeah, I want to say the AVI in general usually uh, didn't have close ties with everybody. There's something about the nerdiness level of AVI that just kind of, yeah, exactly. That everybody's just like, kidding. you know what? We're not cool with you guys. You guys have had some books. You guys are the smart kids. Your stuff always breaks and causes issues for the rest of us. We don't really like you. No, absolutely. And, you know, over time, and I think that's with anything, even, even when you're a kid, you, you see someone that has differences in you and you don't always flock toward it or you make fun of it. Uh, but I think as you get older, you know, you tend to uh, to attract to different things. And uh, one thing I actually learned uh, to appreciate about you guys is how much you guys are uh, in the books. I remember your shop was on you guys about like the smart part where my MOS. Yeah, you got to be smart, but it's a lot about like all of us are damn near bodybuilders coming out of school, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's so, definitely something that I appreciate about your shop. I can always remember uh, being in Iraq and trying to hide out in there. You guys had AC. And it always worked really well. Nobody was on your case, you know, about like, hey, can I just come in here and just sit for a second? Because I've been going nonstop for eight hours, and now they want me to just sweep the sand in Iraq. So I just need a place to sit down and relax. And you guys are always welcome. I was like, yeah, come on in here. And I think, like, my biggest thing with you is when I met you, there was, like, you're always striving to evolve and grow. Not only were you like physically trying to be as strong as you possibly could and see what you were capable of and challenging yourself, but it was also intellectually. You were like, no, I want to get promoted. So I'm going to do everything possible to ensure that that happens. So you were constantly growing mentally and growing physically. And I was like, right, these, everybody makes you guys out to be kind of a little bit slower than the rest of us, but you guys are are putting in more effort than I see in other shops. Like if I went into airframes or if I went to flight line, they're mostly just eating and sitting around playing video games. (laughs) Particularly airframes, to be honest. Oh, um, man. You know, like I'm I feel like flight lines was, was that, like yeah. the like the college kids, cool kids, some of them. Uh, but airframes, you could pretty much go in there, and it was they were playing th- playing cards, playing dominoes, eating, but not usually a lot more than that. <laughs> yeah, there's a. Uh, I would say airframes had a lot of strong kids too, so a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, don't get it twisted. I did my fair share of eating too. You know what I'm saying? That's I was always trying to get big. That's neither here nor there. Um, <laughs> but so to go back a little bit, um, because I wanted to give the, I wanted to give the uh, the appearance and the experience of like how we met specifically. Uh, but your parents met you before I did, so I want to know about <laughs> baby Liz. You know, it's not growing up in Lafayette, Louisiana. How was that? 
Uh, it was brief, you know, that's uh, where I was born. And But my father joined the Air Force right after he had me. Um, I guess, not I was prior to my time, but he'd been in the Air Force and he'd been in the reserves. He decided to go active duty so that he could have health insurance for us, so he could provide for us. Just realizing that there's a lot more responsibility on the table having a child. Um, that landed him in Florida and Cape Canaveral where they ended up having my sister. And then after that, he requested orders to Okinawa. It was on like on the list of places he'd always wanted to see. Uh, we went out there. Uh, everybody fell in love with it. It became home. That's where my earliest memories are is of being in Okinawa, Japan. And then my parents split up. My mom stayed there because she's originally from New York City. And she her memories were just of some of the crime that, that happened there. And in Okinawa, there's like zero, very little to zero crime. She's like, there's really, how can you beat it? We can always just go, I can let you kids go to the ocean by yourselves and somebody will know you're safe and come back. And she couldn't say that anywhere else. So she decided to stay there when my parents split. Um, ended up working multiple jobs just trying to provide for us. Got remarried um, a while after the divorce. And that's, we really just built roots there until I joined the Marine Corps from Okinawa. That's crazy because, you know, we read about Japanese culture, like, you know, throughout school. But what was it that initially attracted? Because, I mean, it's a pretty big difference going from America, you know, going overseas or somewhere like Okinawa. Now, obviously that's somewhere we can be stationed at and, uh, you know, in the armed forces, but wh like, what would, what would make it to where you said that your dad wanted to go to Okinawa? Like what, like what was his motivation behind that? Uh, I think it was really just uh, to experience something different. Um, I mean, he ended up because he was in the air force, he was actually in Korea for about a year and that's where he fell in love. He fell in love with Korea brought that culture and that love of that culture. He spoke, he came back speaking the language after only being there for a year. Um, he, yeah, he, he just like culturally dove in, spoke the language, knew all the good food and stuff, turned us on to the good food. And I think both of them just had an appreciation for diversifying culture and really wanted to experience the whole world. And that's something that he noticed he could dive into by being in the air force and, and seeking out the opportunities to get stationed wherever they would allow him to. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, obviously there's a bunch of Americans in, in Okinawa and Iwakuni throughout Japan because, you know, we go over there and we have kids. We, you know, <laughs> we get married to, you know, the local populace. But uh, what was it like being American? Uh, I'm not granted. Obviously, you know, we have ties with, with Okinawa. So I, I'm sure you understand what I'm saying by this. But yes. like, what was it like being over there as, like, as a young kid? I guess you didn't really have too much experience being in the United States at that point, but Obviously, you came back eventually, and you could probably see what the difference is. Yeah, you know, um, growing up there, the biggest thing, I mean, the Okinawan culture, I would say, is is uniquely different from the Japanese culture, from the mainland islands. Um, it was just a place where I got to be a jungle child. Like, I was running around through the boonies of Okinawa, climbing trees, trying to evade habus, evade all the, the banana spiders. And uh, I just think kind of a different childhood than what people would anticipate in Okinawa. But I lived off base. So in order for me to live off base, I had to know the culture. I had to be able to understand the cultural differences that you don't see here. Um, I spoke the language. I loved Okinawan food more than I loved American food because that's what I knew. Um, when like things that most people don't know is like if there's a typhoon or a hurricane is, is it's known in the States and that hits the island, the bases get shut down and the Americans aren't allowed to live. So one thing I'd always love is like, hey, it's so weird. The whole place is closed because in our we grew up with this is just normal. You don't nothing shuts down because you have a typhoon. It's just normal <laughs> life. But the only difference is you notice there are no Americans on the road. There are no Americans everywhere. Um I mean cultural differences were so significant and Things like if somebody offers you a gift, it's customary there to say no three times, to politely say no, thank you, refuse. Otherwise, you look greedy. And for most Americans, you just say thank you and you take it. So most Americans look very greedy to Okinawans. There are things like that. Um, just the cultural language and how you communicate. It, it's been explained that when you speak in Japanese, it's more like, like bowling. Each person takes their turn. You take your turn, then the next person goes. There's no opportunity to interrupt that process. Whereas in the American culture, it's like playing basketball. Everybody's trying to steal that ball and score. Everybody's trying to be that center of attention and that star, right? So just things like that. When I first came to the States, I, you know, here I am. I really, the only place I've been in the States is Lafayette, Louisiana and Fairbanks, Alaska, which if it was such a small 
world when I would go there. And it was just me seeing my family in this, this little area in their homes. And that's it. It's not really just going out and seeing everything. And then in, in Fairbanks, Alaska, it, it's the same thing. Like we're 13 miles, we were 13 miles outside of town. So again, not really into a culture and it's away from everything. So I thought, I'm like, oh, this is American culture and, and thought this is what it was like. And then I came to the States, went to Pensacola, Florida, went to San Diego, California, all these other places like, oh, this is, this is the American culture. This is not, this is fast paced. They're driving on the other side of the road. There's no saying no three times. No, everybody thinks that I don't talk because they interrupt me. And so I figure it's their turn and they're supposed to speak. So I just shut up. So for, I'd say like the first year being in the States, with the exception of the roommates that I became really good friends with, who were constantly helping me like, hey Liz, don't do that. That's not normal. Or hey Liz, you need to do this. Uh, people thought I didn't speak. It's like, no, no, I, I talk, but you guys are like desperate to be in that that center and cutting each other off. And I don't understand how to communicate in that way. It's not what I, I grew up with. Um, so it was, it was a really big culture shock coming to the States. And when I finally identified with the United States really was, and not those small towns that I've been. Okay. No, that, that's a, that's a great depiction. Actually, like very well put, <laughs> very well put. No, thank you. Like you, I was like following you the whole time. I was literally watching as you were doing it as if it was me. That was incredible. I appreciate that. But you know, you luckily you didn't have to do that experience on your own. Now, obviously, you know, you have parents, but you also had a, a younger sister that not only you got an opportunity to, you know, experience that with, but that you had an opportunity to be uh, kind of a mentor too as well. So um, what was that like? Actually, a lot of people don't have siblings. You know, some people are, are only child and they don't get the opportunity to experience that. So what was it like not only being overseas uh, the majority of your life, but uh, being able to have a younger sister that looks up to you? Um, it was good in, in a lot of aspects and one, just because we we're so different from each other, even in our appearance, not just because like I'm an athlete, I'm working out, but our hair color is different. Our eye color is different. Our skin tone is different. Our build is different. Um, but when you put us by our parents, you can clearly tell like, oh yeah, that's their daughter. But when you put us next to each other, you're like, oh, you guys just like cousins or something like, no, we're, we're sisters. BFS. Um, <laughs> but even personality wise, like I was very... Um, wanting to please my parents, understanding that in Okinawa, if you get in trouble and you do something like what normal kids do, they drink, they party, they go out, they, they try different things and experiment with life. But if you got busted doing that, you get sent back to the States. And for us, like if you get sent back to the States, where are we going to go? Right. <laughs> you know? Like there was nowhere to go. So I, I really understood um, that there was a lot more weight on the actions that we'd have. And then it also was a reflection on our family and things like that. So for me, I was very much uh, focused on having a job and being responsible and helping pay the pill bills and taking care of myself on keeping, maintaining a GPA and doing all these things to be that like honorable oldest child, like the Asian culture, right? Like that's right, what you right. think of. And it like took on that role. And my sister's like, no, I'm that young party animal. And and she experiments and it really got to be wild and do all these things. So it's like me as the older sister, I'm like, hey, I'm going to come pick you up because you're drunk on gate two street and you're 16 and you shouldn't be doing that. And I need to take you home. You know, like, <laughs> oh no. But it's also but me see, going to my you, yeah, but it's also me going to my sister is the older sister being like, hey, so I just had my first kiss and what was it like for you? Like, you just had your first kiss? What's wrong yeah. with you? <laughs> <laughs> so it was very it like a, a very different relationship that, than I, I would say. Um, and she was really desperate to like get to the United States and want to see that life. And, you know, you see when you live in Japan, you see what what's. The United States is de depicted as you see it's particularly like Los Angeles and California in a lot of people's minds. That's the United States. Like Los Angeles represents the United States with right. the palm trees and driving through with the, the roof down, going through a nice and cool air, eating your tacos. You know, like that's what you think of like skateboarding on the boardwalk. That, that was the United States to us. And she really wanted to go experience that. And I was very hesitant and trying to, to step out and, and make that adventure. So she actually was the first one to move to move back to the States before even I did. And that kind of led the way. So in many ways, I 
was leading as far as what we needed to do like responsibly to make decisions but as far as venturing out and getting to know themselves she definitely did that way before i did she was kind of leading the way right they're like yeah i don't want to make those mistakes like no i'm good <laughs> <laughs> no that, that's cool though seriously because like you know your siblings can sometimes keep you young when you you know you get so caught up into how things oh i gotta have a job i gotta do this you get so stagnant to where like me i end up staying in the house sometimes i'm like so focused on doing other things now you got this like you know a younger friend or a younger you know sibling that's like no i want to go surfing or i want to go do this kind yeah. of force you to get out of your comfort zone as well so uh, that's uh that's absolutely awesome but to also stay out of trouble you did some, now you did your sports out there too right yeah you i did. did all type of sports yeah no i was uh very much which you think of as like a stereotypical kid in ADHD. I'm not saying that I'm diagnosed ADHD, but as far as attention span, I'm like, hey, today I want to play baseball. Tomorrow I want to be an astronaut. No, I want to play soccer. Yeah, so, and I'm like, yeah, I'm bored with that, which cost-wise, when you think about it, that's not cheap. So I had to start working young. I was like, hey, if you want to keep doing all these sports, I'm cool with it, but I'm not going to pay for it anymore. Like this costs money to keep enrolling you in all these sports. Uh, so soccer was really the sport I, I ended up connecting with for the longest because I went to OCSI, Okinawa Christian School International, which okay. is a school, American school off base. And that one really the only sport that you could continue growth with and they had scholarship opportunity, college opportunity was soccer. I mean, they had cross country and they also had volleyball, but I didn't want to do cross country because I hated running, which is really funny when you consider soccer. Uh, and I didn't want to play volleyball because of the short shorts and they were tight and I did not feel comfortable doing that. So I stuck with soccer for the longest. Oh, so was, was soccer like, I mean, you could dedicate yourself to a sport and it may not be your less of your favorite one, but was that like the one that you enjoyed doing the most? Uh, no, what I enjoyed the most is tackle football. I love oh, yeah. tackle football. Like if I went to the youth center, it was always not even like putting on gear. Like, let's just do it. Let's throw down, throw each other through the air, smash it. Not the correct way. Like there are no plays. I didn't know what I was doing. I'm like, hey, I'm a, I'm a small little girl. Nobody ever expects me to catch and run fast. <laughs> I'm never going to hit you and take you down, right? Like they just kind of, so it's constantly like interception, boom, blast by, smash you through the air incorrectly. Like now I look, I'm like, yeah, I was basically doing like MMA takedowns to get nice. people to the ground. I just didn't know better. Yeah, uh, so that was about... really the sport that I loved the most. But as far as like the potential for growth, it there wasn't any. My school didn't have it. So if I wanted to continue on, I couldn't do it. And then um, it just, it was everything I wanted. Once I understood there were plays and memorizing stuff, I was like, I don't really like that. Like, I just want to go, I see an opportunity, take advantage of the opportunity. <laughs> no, absolutely. And it's, you know, it, it's great that you mentioned competition and, and, Speaking of competition, like going a little bit outside of the sports, your 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 dad being in the Air Force, but you deciding to go Marine Corps. So did you try to kind of how much out of one of them and, and what like what gave you the idea at what point were you like, you know what, I'm considering joining the military? Uh, you know, so I think I, I there was always kind of an inkling and an urge to want to join the military. Uh, at that time, I wasn't sure which branch I wanted to go into. I just knew that that was there was. For one, I would just see people in uniform and it looked to me just so badass to see somebody in uniform and to wear it well and do it with pride. Then you right. see it like you see people like wearing any like a McDonald's uniform, you're like, yeah, this is really look as cool. And and mind you, like if you look at the Japanese culture and the Okinawan culture and their want to provide the best customer service, and they always like their uniforms are always clean cut and clean, it would definitely give you like a wrong idea of what it could be because if i look at the united states that would have been really clear like yeah i'm definitely not going into anything other than the military and it wasn't so clear cut in japan because they do such a good job of having honor in any job that it is that you do and there's no disrespect it's never looked down on everybody has a role in society to provide for each other whereas here like there's definitely a pecking order of what's cool and what's not for a job and like right. oh you're a trash collector Ooh, it was like yeah but they actually make more money than the average person right um, but yeah, wouldn't necessarily have gotten that, you know, uh, but one thing that was really important to me was that competitive nature and that drive with sports. And one thing that I noticed on base is that there was always people as adults in the military playing sports. There was always people that are in the gym and they're trying to grow physically. And that was a, a huge appeal to me. And then as I started coming up, I actually worked on base at the education center. 
So not only that, but I got to see people coming into the education center to further their education. Then I actually worked at the college on base. So I got to see them like, well, everybody that's here, there's very few dependents. It's more often than not active duty personnel that are in here trying to further education. I thought that was really unique. And it was, for the most part, it seemed like everybody was trying to achieve that of their own accord. It wasn't pushed on them. It was nothing else except within themselves, that self-growth. And so watching that, there's just something really appealing. And then my best friend's je- uh, dad was a Marine. And he, to me, was everything that a father, a husband, a role model should embody. He took pride in, in being the leader of his family and in trying to take care of his family, be goofy, be there for them, but also encourage them to further their education and further their bodies and growth. Um, he was a gunnery sergeant and leading his Marines by example, like fit, doing powerlifting and bodybuilding competitions. But also he had a bachelor's degree and it was, it was con- so he just had this awesome balance. And then when I saw him getting dressed blue, I was like, oh my God, that is a awesome yes. uniform like that that did it um but i also worked for my mom on base and she ran a photography business so we got to take pictures for every air force ball navy ball marine corps ball all of them and so not only so you get to see everybody dress up and get to show off but you also got to see how officers treated and listen how enlisted treated officers how people were when they drunk which to me can kind of show some true colors and what i noticed is that the marines for one there was no disrespect between the enlisted and the officers. There was, there was a professionalism and a respect amongst each other. When right. the Marines got drunk, they grabbed each other, threw each other in the taxi, had accountability and took them back to the barracks so they wouldn't be an international incident. Whereas like I had the other branches not to talk down on them, but they like destroyed our equipment. They were like trying to start fights with each other. The uh, wives were throwing around their husband's ranks as though that was their off, their ranks. And I was like, I... No, I'm good. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And so just seeing all that, all that, I started to just, it was just like more glaring for me that the Marine Corps just stood out amongst everything else. And I also started to come to realize I really didn't like school. And I knew that like, ah, uh, yeah, maybe soccer will be it. Maybe I can get it. I've been pretty reassured that through my endeavors in sports that I could get a full ride scholarship. But I have to get room and board and get travel out to go see the scout. The scouts don't come to Japan. I have to go out and see them and hope that I do everything right in that two week camp to get taken on and to get a full ride scholarship. And I knew my family couldn't afford to do it. I've been working since I was 12, 13 years old full time. So I knew that like there was no possibility financially that anybody was going to be able to help participate in pursuing college education. And I also knew I didn't really like it. So I was like, I don't really know what else there is. I'm trying to, I'm working in a college and I really don't like this. And the military looks really appealing. And my original plan was I'm going to go to school at this college. I'm going to get my bachelor's degree and go in as an officer, right? Because you, everybody knows you get paid better. You get better living if you go in as an officer. Um, But then it is like, and there's the potential where I could go in as an officer and I could play soccer in the Air Force or the Navy as my job. Like, that's pretty right. cool. Like, I'm going to try and do that. Uh, but then as I started to do, to work on getting just my my generals done for my associate's degree, I very quickly realized, like, no, nah, I'm, I'm not a college kid. This isn't going to work. I'm not going to make it to my bachelor's to go officer. So I finally broke the news to my family. I'm like, look, guys, I'm going to join the Marine Corps. I think, like, I can make a difference. I know because, we, I mean, we have tons of friends. We're all in military. And my mom was like, begging me, please, just not the Marine Corps. Of all the branches, do Air Force. Wow. I was like, well, because like one of our friends, he was the sergeant major for the infantry on um, on Hanson. Oh, and okay. so yeah, and so if when we would go visit him and 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 say hi to him, he had to get his Marines because there's no no bathrooms, there's no heads for females. He had to go get his Marines to go clear it, stand watch outside if we went to just go pee. And my mom, and he told us, he's like, there's plenty of other bases like this where they do not have, they do not cater to women and women are, they're not a part of that MOS. And so places you go where you're going to run into experiences like this. And in my mind, I'm like, I don't have a problem with it. And my mom, of course, is like seeing the worst of everything. Like, no, you can't do this. I was like, what if I'm the change? Like, what if, what if I'm the difference? Why can't I go in and show people that women can hold their own 
and, and I can be, I can make a difference and go into an MOS that has been male dominant and only men and maybe introduce women into it. Why can't I be different for that? And so I thought that I was going to make this huge change and go in there. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm in, I'm going to get my degree. So then I can always go back and, and go either warrant officer or I can go back as an officer. And that was originally what I had going into it. And none of that happened, but... <laughs> No, I mean, if anybody, to me, if anybody was going to make a difference, it's you. And you, to me, you made a huge difference uh, to a lot of people as far as how they viewed. I mean, yeah, it's kind of stoic ways and some people are going to probably get upset about it, but of how a lot of people viewed females being in the military. Yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, I appreciate you setting that positive example. Um, and yeah, you, I could tell if I didn't know what branch you were in, I could tell Marine Corps because, you know, you, you definitely played with the big boys. Like you were always tough <laughs> and everything and nobody was scaring you from nothing. And it was just like, I, I loved it. That just that energy alone, you know, it's, it's very uh, glamorizing to me. So I know you talked about going to college and uh, you know, not wanting to necessarily finish the degree program. Uh, and you know, you, you spoke about like the different examples of what kind of made you lean toward going to the military, especially the Marine Corps. But what made you want to go avionics? Were you one of those kids that took apart all the remotes, get the little screwdriver and there's springs all over the place because <laughs> you wanted to see how it worked? So if you remember when I was in the Marine Corps, I would say that outside of like what I tried to achieve with challenging myself and like, hey, my goal today is to do 100 pull-ups on the pull-up bar and I'm going to run 12 miles. Outside of that, if you knew me for being an avionics man, I was known for breaking everything and things have never been broken, if you remember that. I don't know anything about that, you know. It's fair. It is what it is. And I will, I'll happily admit it. So I was definitely the kid that took things apart to see how it worked, but never the kid that put it back together. Mm. Okay. And when I joined the Marine Corps, I said, hey, I, I want to do I want to do recon. I want to be a recon Marine. And they're like, well, you can't because you're a female. But they said, like, as of score, you can do whatever unless you want. I'm like, okay, I want to do counterintelligence. You can't. You're a female. I'm like, okay. I want to do canine. I, I want to work with dogs and I want to train them. Well, you can't because you don't have an American license and you're not tall enough. I had a growth spurt in the Marine Corps, surprisingly. Like in boot camp, I grew two inches. So had that not been the case, I could. It was like the one last waiver I could have gone that, but it didn't work out. Um, so I, I finally told my recruiter, I was like, hey, I just want a job where I'm never going to see the same place twice. I'm constantly moving. I want to get a workout just by doing my job. I want to be on my feet all day long and just me doing my job will naturally be a workout. That's what I want. And he's like, cool, I got the job for you. You're gonna be, uh, what he, how did he put it? In uh, avionics technician, mm. which when you look at it, I, it could have fallen into a lot of different MOSs. Oh, absolutely, um, yeah. And I said, hey, just whatever it is, just nothing's electricity. Like I have a really, a really bad stuff happens to electricity. I break anything electronic. I crash computers. I've shut down circuits at homes. Nothing's electronic, so. So, of course, I graduate boot camp. The drill instructor is going through all of it, and they're like, Carmouche, you're going to be a pogue? I'm like, I don't know what that is, but I know that tone doesn't sound good. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, possibly, yeah. like, you, I thought you were Marines, Marine. I'm like, I don't, no, no, I'm not going to be a pogue. I don't know what that is, but if that's what you're saying, like, no, I'm going to be a Marines, Marine. Like, yeah, Green Marine. Like, no, you're not going to be a Green Marine. That's not what you're going to do. <laughs> And they're like, you're going to be aviation electrician. And I was like, no, 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 not, not, not electrician. I specifically said, can we look back at that contract? Like, no, I specifically said nothing with electricity. They're like, oh, I hate to tell you, but you're an avionics electrician. There's a, can I, can I fail school and not be, but of course then I get to school <laughs> yeah. and I can't like not, I can't fail at anything. Like I just refuse. I'm like, I'm going to be the top 10 of every class I go to top 10 boot camp, top MCT, A school, C school. Like I couldn't not do that. Like I refuse. I'm like, okay, well at least I'll have some control over this. And if I graduate boot camp in the top 10%, I get next rank. If I graduated with CT, I get to choose there's something we got to choose if you graduate from CT. If I if I graduate top 10 in A school, then I get to choose the C school I go to. If I graduate top 10 in C school, I get to choose the base that I go to. So at right. least I tried to like control those once I realized like, oh, I got screwed over by my recruiter and I'm exactly what I said I never wanted to be. <laughs> I hope he or she hears this too. Do your job. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> no, that's, that. I mean, I felt the same way. I mean, we were always... 
you know, our group of people, like we were competitive, you know, A school, boot camp, MCT. I was always trying to finish number one at, at everything. Yep. And it was a lot of the times because I thought I couldn't do it. So I'm like, man, a lot of these guys are smarter than me. They ain't stronger than me. So I got them on this part. Check. Now it's time to get smart on these things. And it was a challenge for me. I studied a lot more than probably a lot of these guys that it just naturally came to them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, finishing, you know, top two or whatever every time was was pretty uh, significant. It was a big accomplishment for me. Yeah. Uh, so now that you, you know, you, you spoke about how you uh, accidentally became uh, aviation electronics and uh, why you kind of geared your way toward the Marine Corps. Uh, what was it like being like a, a, a new Marine? Like what was that experience? And, and I actually interviewed a female or a, let's say I'm not too political, a, a woman. And uh, she you she know. got out. She was a Marine. Yeah, I get I get thrashed about that. So hey, I'm sorry if I said the wrong thing. I'm sorry, people. Um, actually, I interviewed her. She had gotten out. She talked about her experience of um, from the time that she got on the bus, like when they picked her up and they took her on the bus to get to the the barracks. Dudes were like whistling at her, catcalling, and essentially like claiming her, like oh, oh that, that one's mine type thing. Yeah, I, I forgot the name is I. I got something wrong in my brain. I I, I forget everything nowadays, but. Um, I'll put a link for the, the the actual interview in the description, and I'll put like some of the uh, the shorter clips if you ever want to see it. Okay, yeah, cool. So she, yeah, she went into like this whole thing about how she felt uh, in certain parts of her time there, how she felt uncomfortable uh, being a female in the Marine Corps. I mean, she's tough too, but should you really have to tough through that, you know? Yeah, and I definitely say that there were, um, I would say more often than I noticed it is whenever we went on training deployments. And that's when, you know, like you see different side when guys are, when, or not just guys, when anybody says like different zip code, different rules, you know? And so that was constantly what I would see would happen where people were like, they have wives back home. One, you know, in our job, like if you wore your ring, it puts you at risk. You're not supposed to wear your ring out in the flight line, Thanks. right? So for some of them, I, you know, you don't know that they're married until something happens like the Marine Corps ball and they show up with their wife and their kids or something. And you're like, oh, you're married with kids? You were trying to pick her up the entire time that we were on that debt. Whoa. So there, there are definitely things like that. And it, you, you know, you definitely have to come to terms with it. And it was one of those things I told myself where this is just the way it is. I knew at least going into the Marine Corps, having grown up around the military bases, at least what I was getting into. I, I knew right. what you hear about rumors and things like that, saw it firsthand. But like going into boot camp at least. I knew exactly what I was getting into in boot camp. I mean, the the benefit that I had is my best friend's dad had been a uh, drill instructor. So he was at least able to like tell me something's out. And not only was he active duty military, but her mother was had been military too. And the Marine Corps, they met together in the Marine Corps at their first duty station. And she got out after her enlistment, he stayed in. So right. she had a whole different perspective of what the Marine Corps was like than he did. He stayed because he loved it. And he, he never saw anything else other than being a Marine. She saw it as like, okay, I did this chapter of my life now I'm moving on. So two different perspectives and different input for me to really understand and have a full perspective of it. Um, so when they're like describing boot camp, I'm like, yeah, this sounds great. Like, I don't honestly see anything. I mean, this sounds amazing. So even in boot camp, when most people are like crying or they're wetting their pants and stuff in formation, I'm just like, yeah, this is, I actually expected this to be worse. This isn't bad at all. <laughs> so at least like in, in that sense, uh, it wasn't, there's nothing surprising about that. And having been around Okinawa where the barracks aren't always that well, you know, like any Marine Corps barracks we know, they're not usually very well maintained, right? It's not opposed like you go in the Air Force. I'm like, you guys have AC? That's funny because I just dropped my friend this and their AC isn't even working on the Marine Corps side. Air Force, you guys have have cable in here this is amazing you know things like that so i knew what i was getting myself into as far as everybody knows like marines we use duct tape for everything because you don't really have you're not funded to take care of and to do the right things you learn to adapt and overcome with what you have available to you and that's it um mm -hmm. so at least i knew when i got to boot camp when i got to mct when i got to all the schools i had a really good idea of what i was getting into right so none of that really came as a surprise um, and even I say what really came as the biggest surprise for me was the don't ask, don't tell, because for me, 
I didn't really come into my own in that respect until my first deployment. So the end of my first deployment was I still kind of like, I think I might be gay. And then I got back and I went to Hillcrest for the first time and I'm like, oh, I'm gay. I am so gay. Oh my God, what am I going to do now? <laughs> so that was really the only part I wasn't prepared for and the hardest part because in my mind, it it never crossed my mind as a possibility. It wasn't anything I'd played out. It wasn't really? a part of like my Marine Corps journey was having to deal with coming to terms with who I was during the don't ask, don't tell policy in a unit that very much frowned upon homosexuals being in the Marine Corps. So like, I mean, and forgive me if I'm being invasive, I'm trying to keep it general. So, no, no, not, you're good. so this wasn't something that like you knew since you were a kid, as you came up through high school, you see, no, I mean, I, I definitely had an idea when I was a kid and I can remember like telling my sister when I was younger, we both kind of have this memory of me being like, I think I really like my teacher. My sister would be like, what do you mean? I'm like, no, like I like, like my teacher, she's pretty. And so like trying to explain it, but I must've been like five years old, six years old, young, not able to. And then I want to say it was like 10 and my mom and I had always have these very philosophical conversations and like sit out on the balcony and look out and be like, what do you think the first people thought when they saw the stars? And what do you think, where were they at at that time? So like just these type of conversations, this type of person my mom is. And I can remember saying, saying to her like, I think, I think I like girls. And she's like, okay, well, what do you think you like about girls? Like they're really pretty. She's like, yeah, I definitely think that the female form is a lot more beautiful than the male form. And maybe like, Mm, that's not what I meant. Well, no. and then just dropping it, right? And my mom, nothing like she, her, her sister, her older sister, it was gay. Um, she was very much in the movement of peace, love, and everybody to each their own. No judgment on anyone. So I know that there was never anything to worry about there. But in Okinawa, I had also never seen a homosexual couple before ever. Mm. And in my school, it was OCSI. If you were gay, you were going to hell. And even then, like, we weren't allowed to listen to music because dancing led to, to sex, which was a sin. And you couldn't throw, you know, it's like people didn't date openly, all these things. So it just was always kind of there in the back of my mind, but I never entertained it because going to a school, like a Christian school where it's so frowned upon, right. you, it's just like, just put it off in the back of your mind. Like, no, you're going to live this lifestyle and be this person. And it wasn't until, like, I want to say maybe a week before I was going to Iraq, that I was talking with my friend. They're like, are you sure you're not gay? I'm like, ah, uh. and I was like, all right, good night. Like we're like st just sitting up talking, having conversations back and forth, getting to know each other. And that's like the, the pin drop last question. And I didn't have an right. answer for it. And then I like go back to my room and I'm just thinking like, I might be gay. I never really thought I actually might be gay. And then I'm like, oh, here I am going to Iraq. And again, you just put it off to the back of your mind. You're just trying to make it through that deployment and, right. and make it through there. And then meeting certain people in Iraq, again, more conversations and getting to know people and, and realizing like, yeah, I think I might be gay. <laughs> and then got back and, and those same people like, you should check out Hillcrest. And I can remember because we got back from Iraq and we're getting, you know, like our usual Liberty brief, like, okay, wherever you guys do, just don't go to Hillcrest. Right. Cause it's drugs and gays and all this. And I was like, you just told me I'm, we're going to Hillcrest. Why would you set me up like that? Why are we not allowed to go there? So I'm like hiding in the shadows. Like, am I allowed to be here? Is this okay? And, uh, you know, so that definitely made the whole experience in the Marine Corps different than what I could have possibly expected. Mm. That's So, I mean, I know you talked about how you had like numerous conversations with different people before you came to the realization. Um, but what was the moment, and if you did have one or not, to where you actually broke the ice to the masses, whether it was late when social media hit, whether it was after you got out and now you feel safe to say it without getting like any repercussions, or did you ever like do like a massive, hey, everybody just let you know, or was, did people just figure it out over time? I think for one, like, I mean, even the people that I talked to while I was still in, I was kind of an obvious eyesore that there's like, they're like, what do you, you think you're not gay? I'm like, yeah, I'm not gay. I'm not gay. No, not at all. And they're like, no, you definitely you're are. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, there was always, there was that. So I didn't really think that people I had to, there's very many people I had to tell. They're like, yeah, we just, you don't have to say anything. We just knew. 
But when I got back, um, I definitely, it was something where I was starting to date someone and I felt like I needed to help my family. And so the first person I called is my sister. Cause like, I know of all people, like I've watched, I picked her up from, from parties. I picked her from concerts where she's making out with a girl is I'm going to pick her up. Like I definitely don't have to worry about telling my sister. It's not a doubt there. Um, and while I didn't want it, like I didn't have a worry with my mom. I also knew like, she's talked about grandchildren. This I've, I've been very clear since I was a child. I never want to reproduce all for adoption, all for fostering, never for burying my own children. Um, and I felt like that was kind of like that disappointment with telling her. So I called my sister and I told her when I got back from Iraq, like, Hey, I'm dating someone and it's a woman. And I just have to tell you I'm gay. And she's like, yeah, I, I know. Like, duh. Why are you telling me this? Like, of course I already know. I'm like, Oh, well, you know, like all the doubts and the weird phases and the attempting to date guys and not really working. You could have helped me through all of that confusion for both of us. And she's like, you don't think that we didn't try to tell you? We tried. You were hard headed and didn't listen. And so I'm like, okay, well, I don't tell mom that I told you first, but I got to call mom now. So I call my mom and she's like, yeah, we knew. I'm like, are you actually, were you actually like telling us? Yeah, we already knew. I'm like, Again, this would have been so much easier if you guys could help me through this process. So I came out to my to my sister and then to my mom the moment I like maybe a few days after getting back from Iraq when I when I was pretty confident. Um, and then I would say there was like one other friend that I came out to and that ended up actually compromising our relationship because we both had grown up, gone to school to the same school. And she was very religious and very Christian and very much believed that it, it um, by making that statement and by embracing that, that I compromised my soul and I was going to hell. So she's like, unfortunately, so I was like, okay, well, I don't know that we can be friends if you constantly want to pray over me all the time and you're telling me I'm going to hell. Like, that's just, right. it's, this isn't like, I've tr trust me, I've tried to, to not be gay. I've tried everything in me to not do this and to embrace it and to believe everything that we are indoctrinated in in school but this isn't who I am and I'm unhappy by lying to myself and not being true to myself anymore. Um, and then when I got out of the Marine Corps, I wouldn't say that I was like screaming at the rooftops, but I certainly just didn't want to hide anymore. I knew hiding in the shadows and like dating somebody in the Marine Corps and trying to, trying to openly date them. But you want to go through Hillcrest. And I'm told as we're going on a safety briefing, like, Hey, my wife and I are going to be driving through Hillcrest. So if we see you, we're going to, we're going to report you. And we're going to get you kicked out of the Marine Corps. So I'm like, oh, so literally like hiding in the shadows, like turning, like, is it safe to walk around? Is it safe to do anything? So not being able to be open. And I didn't live on, I didn't live in the barracks. I lived off base with my girlfriend, but I can't openly tell that to anybody. Right. You know? So just things like that. When I got out where I'm like, I'm not going to throw it in people's faces. I'm not going to make this big thing and be like, Hey guys, I'm gay. But I'm also, I'm not going to hide it. it. It is who I am and I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable, but I also don't want it to be a surprise to anyone. So and my first thing was like, I got a ra rainbow mouthpieces. It, it was more of a point of pride for me, which is like right. that reminder to never hide that anymore. Cause it was hard to do. I'd spent my entire time in the Marine Corps coming to this realization, three deployments, and then spending all three deployments hiding and being scared, you know? And it was more like a point of like, be strong and don't be scared anymore. You don't have to hide anymore. And that was really the mouthpiece for me. And that's what it was, was saying. But I can remember my first fight, I'm warming up with my coach and he he knew and he was just wanting me to say it, to be open and a very accepting guy. But he's like, hey, do you think that that girl's cute? I'm like, yeah, I guess so. And just like run the sprint and then come back. And he's uh. like, what about her? I'm like, oh, uh, and just keep running and sprinting. And then finally, like the next day, I'm like, hey, I have to tell you something when I'm gay. He's like, yeah, why do you think that I was asking you if we thought those chicks were, were cute? I'm like, I don't know. She's like, because I just wanted you to be comfortable. Like, I don't care. You you put in more work than anybody else. That's all I care about. Be a good, a good training partner. Be a good person. That's the only thing I care about. And that's the only thing anybody else here cares about. I was like, okay. So then the mouthpiece really about. for me was just that coming out and telling everybody and never having to hide it. And if somebody asks, not lying about it and not trying to like maneuver the conversation away from it. So I never had to lie like, oh, well, so do you like women? I mean, have you seen how it looks out here today? Like, I'm just sidetracking. <laughs> uh, uh, blue? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. No, so you know speaking of fighting and you know it ties into you know you kind of like coming out a little bit more about uh and becoming more comfortable with saying that you were gay um and you know that that 
I guess being more comfortable with it. Um, at what point did you know that fighting was something that was an interest of yours? Um, so I was actually, so I can remember like when we were in Iraq, we had AFN on AFN, they used to play strike force. Right. And so that's what everybody did. Like we had any downtime, everybody's watching strike for us and getting into the fights. And at that time, people, there'd been a few people like, Hey, check this out. Like the first fight I saw, the guy got cut on the head. There's blood everywhere. And I'm just like, no, 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 no. Like not interested. <laughs> uh, and then like the post fight conversation, the guy was just super disrespectful to the guy that had lost sounded just really belligerent and uneducated. He wasn't articulate. I was like, no, this is just three street thugs in there for entertainment. Like this is, not why are you guys entertained by this? I was like, no, I'm good. I'm going to go back out and keep working on the aircraft. Like I don't yeah. want to watch this. Um, and then it was actually major Espinoza. He was a okay. major at the time. Yep. He, he'd actually, he's like, Hey, you know, you're always trying to strive to better yourself and you're seeking to be the best that you can. I really think that you should check out MMA. I was like, no, I saw that on TV. I don't, I don't like MMA. It's not for me. He's like, right. no, just, just try out some of the workouts. He's like, look, I do jujitsu. My kids do jujitsu. I really think it'd be a really great fit for you. You should try it out. And I have so much respect for who he was. And like, he was again, one of those people that just prided himself on his appearance and seeking to better himself in every way. I was like, okay, well, I have a lot of respect for him and what he has to say. And I value his input. So I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to check it out. Um, and then I really started, I got BJ Penn's book and I started studying like the diet plan that he had in there, tried doing some of the, the techniques he had in there, was feeling horribly, was like, yeah, I'll check this out. Um, and I want to say, uh, maybe it's the end of my, the first or the second deployment, just us just like trying different people going back in the dojo and be like, hey, let's try this out. I'm like, did this work? And they're like, I don't know, but it hurts. So like, all right, let's just keep going. Those were some <laughs> you know, good like, times. Yeah, and just just feeling that way. And then I came back, I was like, you know what? I, I really like getting back into it. And I really want to do martial arts. Because I did I did karate a little bit. I did taekwondo, aikido, just a little bit when I was in Japan. But again, it was like the attention span. A month of this and a month of that. And I never stuck with those. Um, right. But I remembered like there were just certain things in it that seemed really cool. I'm like, I, I want to I try and, and seek that out again. So uh, I sought out one of the dragons, not white dragon, but one of those dragon variations. There's a Kempo place that said they also offer jiu-jitsu and MMA. I was like, cool, this is like everything all in one and I'll just try it out. And so here I am like sparring these heavyweight, light heavyweight, middleweight guys coming in with black eyes. And what was more acceptable then is like, I would come in, I'm bruised, I'm battered. Like I said, black eyes, busted up, busted nose, everything. And like, Hey, Karmush, what happened to you this week? And I'm like, I got drunk and I decided to dive into the pool and miss. And I'm like, okay, I'm like, that's, that's more acceptable. Cause like, I can remember saying like, oh, I'd like to like train MMA. And like, no, you can't do that. I'm like, so it's more acceptable to get drunk and like trip going into a pool than to train yeah. MMA. I fell out of my rack. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was, I'd say really my third deployment is when I, second and third deployment, I really got serious. The third deployment, I really got into it. I started like really watching the UFC, really watching Strike Force. I had it in my mind that I was going to get out. I was going to fight at 145 and I was going to dethrone Chris Cyborg and take her belt from her. Little did I know, not even close to a 145 or I'm way too small for that. Also met Chris Cyborg in person. She's a sweetheart, but she is a massive woman. She's a beast. She is. And her hand engulfs my hand. She can palm my face. Like for another woman to palm your face, is that's, <laughs> you have no business fighting them. It's yeah, embarrassing. You not put those on me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, the third deployment I really had in my mind that I was going to commit more to training and I was going to give it – Maybe it wouldn't go anywhere with it. I had my, like my dream that I wasn't telling anybody is that I wanted to fight against Chris Cyborg and I wanted to take the title from her. Like that's right. I was going to be the next 145 champion, but I didn't tell anybody. I, everybody else I told was like, yeah, I'm just going to try out MMA and, and see how far it takes me. And then when I got out, um, my roommates at the time, they kicked me out of my head. We shared a key. They kicked me out of the place, locked me out. said, go to the MMA gym down the street. You can't come back until you actually go try it out. Six hours later, I was hooked. I had done one class after another, after another, back to back, nonstop. At the end of that, like decided like, yeah, I, I really like this. But 
at that time, I didn't know if it was going to take me anywhere. I didn't know if, um, you know, like if I really had a future, I started right before my 26th birthday and everybody else to that point was, you're fine. Everybody else to that point had, that I knew it started 18 or they were wrestling since they were four. They had some martial art background. So I'm like, right. I am so much older just starting off in this process that I'll be lucky if I get an amateur fight or a smoker fight. So I'm just going to see where this takes me. Maybe that dream that I have in the back of my head that I haven't expressed, maybe won't ever be a reality. I didn't realize just because I was like, I'll do the work. I have no problem putting in six hours, eight hours a day doing the proper nutrition. I have no problem with that. I didn't realize like age would ever be a factor that could potentially keep me from it. Um, and honestly, it wasn't until I finished my associate's degree using the GI Bill to go to school to be able to train that um, I did a few years in my professional career, like two years in my professional career, when I finally realized like, no, I love this. This is 100% for me. Everything I do is going to be about this. I want to see how far I can get this. I want a belt and I'm going everything I have until I get that belt. So from the, the from the first time you decided, not necessarily that you were interested, from the first time you actually dedicated like a couple classes and became consistent to your actual first fight, which... Now, had you had a fight prior to that the, the, when no. you went to the UFC? So the oh, UFC? yeah. Uh, prior, okay. to, no, prior to the UFC, I'd been fighting for three years before that first UFC fight. So for your first fight outside, like how long was it from the time you decided to start training until that fight to your first Three fight? years. Well, it took you three so, years to get to your first fight? So for me to take my, my first fight, I took... My first amateur fight, four fights after I started, four months after I started training. So I started training in January 2010, right? Like I got out my, I got out December 29, 2009. I started training January 1st, 2010. I took my first amateur fight in March of 2010 or April 2010. And then May 22nd, I had my first professional fight. So not even a full, oh man. That, that that's incredible that that's a small period you have to have some level of dedication and probably a little bit going on up top oh yeah <laughs> and obviously you had that talent to do it because not everybody starts off the same and like i said i feel like you already had the foundation of of the toughness that it took to do that you know both physically and mentally on your body um so for your your first your first few fights before ufc do you mind kind of speaking on those a little bit yeah. Um, so like when I said, when I first started, started training, I understood that I was, I was working in a deficit compared to everybody else. Like even the, the people my same age, they'd already had a fight career and been pro for years. They had an amateur career that went on for years before they ever went pro. So I knew that I had to play catch up. And so I lived in the gym. Like I went to school from 8 AM until anywhere from 12 to 2 PM. I drove immediately to the gym, did any assignments I had at the gym. And then train from anywhere from like 3 30, 4 o'clock until they close at like 9 30 at night. And that was Monday through Friday. That's what I did. Sometimes even on Saturdays. And then Saturdays, I was at the gym the moment they opened until they closed. Sundays, if we had special trainings, I did special training. Like that was what I did for years straight. And that was like the lifestyle. I understood that I had to play catch up. I didn't know enough. And the only thing I could do was just put in more reps. So every opportunity I had, I lived in the gym. And that's all I did. I lived, breathed, eat, MMA. That was everything that I did was just playing catch up. Um, but it also paid off because I was so dedicated and I was open-minded. And I understood that I was a blank slate, an empty book that didn't have anything. That all I could do was just absorb information. My work ethic exceeded everybody else's. Nobody, and no, but there was not a single person in there that put in as many hours as I did. And other people, there was open-minded. So it paid off. But my my first we were trying to get amateur fights i i went to to tj every time that they wanted to do promo pictures they'd come over and like i said i was in the gym all day long and for those six hours i didn't eat there's no like power bars protein bars there's no eating i i was working on a very fixed income and had no money to afford to buy those type of bars and all those protein supplements everything else it's like no no you just you train for six hours you eat at the end of those six hours you eat what you can. It's a can of tuna. It's a can of tuna. That's, that's what you can afford. Um, so I would just work as hard as I could, but it also meant that I was super shredded. I walked around at my fight weight or just a few pounds shy of what I needed to fight at. 
So every time they do promo pictures, I still had a pump on from training for so many hours. And it's like the end of the gym evening. And like, can you stop flexing? I'm like, I'm not, I'm not flexing. I'm not. So yeah, you, you've always been ripped. Like, so I, <laughs> I, I, I never believe that it's ridiculous. <laughs> But it's also like for women, it, it's intimidating. So every time they go to trauma pictures, they'd be like, no, there's no way she just started training. We don't believe that. Look at her. It's like, no, no, she just like physically does a lot. They're like, no, 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 she just trusts it. She's, they would never believe that I hadn't been training for very long. They, and so people would drop out. They'd be like, okay, you're going to fight on Friday. I'm like, all right, ready to go. But like they dropped out of the fight. And so that just Not kept happening. Her. Yeah, it just kept happening over and over, dropping out of fights. I finally get my first amateur fight and go out there and I KO the girl by a liver shot. I liver kicked her. Um, and that word got out and because it was an open weigh-in. So I think she weighed 167 or so. And I was 135. And thankfully, you know, like push kick her to the body, get in the liver, drop, fight's over. But it was an open weight class. And so the word got out that like, oh, I'll take any fight against any weight. I don't care. I just want to fight. It was kind of like, ah, yeah, we're not going to fight her. And we could not get booked for fights. So finally, my coach is like, hey, just the fight medical. Because the fight medical is in California for if you fight in California are super expensive. And if right. you don't have, have health insurance, we're saying thousands of dollars just past the health certs for each fight in California. And then you also have to pay the athletic commission for your licensing fee. Yeah. So it ends up being really expensive. And you figure the time that you put in, um, all those licensing fees and you have to, your, all your gear, it, gym, it ends up being, gym fees, trainer gym fees. fees. Yeah. It ends up being really, and if you're paying your coach for extra attention, it ends up being really expensive. And so my coach is like, Hey, I know that you can't pay for your, you're struggling to pay for your gym membership. He's like, why don't we just go pro? He's like, you got the technique. I have faith in you. You want to just go pro? I'm like, and me being the young Marine, like I'm barely out of the Marine Corps. So if, if you tell me, go jump off that building, I'm going to go, okay, I'll go jump off that building. Sure. Yeah. Sure, yeah. How far do you want me to jump? <laughs> so, <laughs> so he said, go pro. Fights, how many amateur fights did you end up getting? Was it just, just that one? One, oh. one amateur. Yeah. April, so, I had my amateur. May, I had my first pro fight. See, this is to me, this is why, and I don't know how many times you've told this story, but to me, this is why these type of stories give context to everything. You know, yeah. I, I don't know how, I don't know what the average number of fights that uh, professional fighters have these days, but to have one amateur fight and then to go to the pro, it, that, I mean, I'm sure you're already proud of that, but that's a huge feat right there. I, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it's actually like a huge feat because really for you to go pro, it's just signing an agreement and deciding to give up um, opportunity. Because when, when you go pro, every loss works as a deficit against you. That means that you're constantly trying to work your way back up the ranks. You're trying to prove to sponsors because sponsors don't want to support losers. They want to support winners. Right, right. So every time you lose, lose a fight, it puts all that back. So somebody's like, I'll give you $500 for this fight. They're not like, I'll give you a hundred bucks, yeah. maybe, you know, so it works against you. And also being, being able to manage and understand your nutrition, your workout schedule, your recovery schedule, and then all the media on top of it. Those are all mistakes and lessons as you learn in your amateur career before you ever go pro. So that means that when you do it in your pro career, it's all working against you and mistakes that should have been made as an amateur that don't cost you paychecks are now costing you a paycheck. Right. right? But these are things I didn't understand. That I was like, my coach says, go pro. I'm like, okay, we go pro. Sure, yeah, do whatever you tell me to do. Go jump off the building. I'm jumping off the building. You just tell me to do. And yes, sir, I'm going. So, so what we, was he the same coach that you had while you went pro? Do you did he stay with you from amateur all the way through your pro career? Yeah, yeah, he did. Um, uh, Manolo Hernandez. Yeah, goofy okay. guy, good guy. Um, <laughs> so, so he. We did the pro thing and um, we went out to TJ to Tijuana in Mexico to go take the fight. And they don't really do at that time, at least they didn't really do fight medicals. Like you get there and they're like, cool, you have blood work, right? He's like, yeah. I'm like, what? And like, okay, cool. Just sign this and you're good. I'm like, what? That's, I don't feel very comfortable. Like not yeah. extensive blood work. And when you're brought into anywhere, like if if an organization is like, oh, you're a San Diego representative or whatever city you're from, if you're not that city representative, they're bringing you in to lose. 
that's always what it is. If somebody's a hometown hero and you're like, oh, we'd like you to fight for this person, you're never brought in to win. That's never the case. Mm. So when I went out to TJ, what they were doing is trying to build up this women's division at 135. And they're trying, after this fight is going to crown her the champion. Meanwhile, it's my pro debut. She's had pro fights in boxing. And now she's going, she's diving into her MMA career. So she's actually had fights. And this is my first time in front of the big show. And here I am going out there. My my name's on the poster and everything. I'm like, whoa, not only am I like pro, but I like went up big real quick. Um, and go out there. It's late in the evening. I uh, thankfully win the, win the fight. I end up cutting her in her eye on the cage. The What I learned about myself is the crowd booing fed the fuel for me because of course the entire stadium i don't have friends and family like i i just got out of the marine corps essentially moved to the the hillcrest area so i'm in a new city a new right. area a new gym i left pretty much all my marine corps friends up in oceanside you know so I'm, i have no family around so i'm in a whole new city i don't have anybody in the crowd that's there for me it's just me and this fight <laughs> so there's this whole crowd's booing me i'm like you want to boo me i'm gonna take it out on her so I cut her eye and I just start elbowing and punching the cut in, split mm. her face wide open, fight gets stopped. That whole like championship opportunity for her goes away. And of course that ends my fight current and TJ. <laughs> because, oh, they didn't want you back, huh? Yeah, because it, it, that was like, they were trying to build this whole thing up and, and they didn't have anything against me, but it was built off of her. They needed her to be the representative to build it all up. And when yeah. she went out that way, that that defeated it because she retired after that. She stopped fighting. I retired her fight career. Yeah. So once that happened, like their future endeavors all went away. And after that, then it's just like, I'm just taking fights wherever I get, get, get an opportunity. So then I think I fought in, uh, Oklahoma. No, I, I fought in California. I fought again against uh, a woman who outweighed me significantly. I was 138 wearing jeans, eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. She's undressed, cut cut weight, and she's 165. So that Damn. means like when I stepped back into the cage, I was still 138. Who knows what weight she was at? Um, thankfully, I beat her. My At that time, my jiu-jitsu coach, he was still fighting. He was fighting professionally in MMA. It was his last M MMA fight and my second pro MMA fight. Um, so I wanted to show him that I wasn't as stupid as he thought I was with jujitsu. Right. And when I look back at the video, yeah, it looked pretty bad, but I at least submitted her. I got an arm. Oh, I won. <laughs> yeah, I won. It wasn't pretty. It definitely wasn't pretty. Like, it, like if I look back at it now, I'm like, yeah, it probably was dumb. It's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> then my third fight, uh, I, I fought well-known Valentina Shevchenko out in Oklahoma during winter, out in the middle of nowhere, uh, sliced her open with an up kick, cut her eye open. It couldn't stop bleeding when that fight. And then the next fight, uh, Strike Force has an opportunity to do uh, the Bantamweight tournament. And so it was to reign a new champion for the Bantamweight or a contender for the Bantamweight title. So whoever won the tournament gets to fight Sarah Kaufman. So they have, you have to win, like it, you're fighting multiple fights in one night. And that's how they used to do it. So you're technically, you're having three professional night fights in one night against three different opponents, mm. right? So you go in there, you have your fight, and I went in there as an alternate. So if somebody got injured and they couldn't continue on through the tournament, I got to replace them in the tournament. And so I go out there, I win my fight, and then I'm on standby. Like, yeah, let's go. Let somebody get injured, please. Like, I don't wish this upon anybody, but I want my opportunity to be in strike force and fighting for the belt. Didn't right. happen. Um, it actually was Misha Tate that won the tournament. She got a fight against Sarah Coffin. Um, I, then I think I fought, uh, another fight strike force liked me. They thought I put on a good show. Um, I represented myself well, was plight. So they invited me back and me an other opportunity to fight. I fought against a woman that didn't make weight. She was considered a pioneer in the field. I was brought in as a severe underdog with no opportunity of winning. She was supposed to, this is supposed to be like her be back fight. She had just lost to Chris Cyborg because she moved up a weight division, fought at 145. Was coming down to 135 and there's supposed to be a gimme fight like here's this nobody this this kid that yeah like one is an alternate but she's a nobody hasn't really beat anybody at this time because valentina shevchenko was not a known name at that time right. so they bring her in i end up finishing her and i finished her quicker than chris cyborg had so then, mm. then that like shoots me up and whereas like nobody had known who i was at that time i get a few people like hey are you liz carmen like, how do you know who i am because I was just on television. It didn't occur to me. Like I was just on television. 
And then uh, I'm at home, I'm celebrating, have a good time. And so within my first year, I had nine fights, the amateur plus eight professional fights. Yeah. Damn. And I thought that was the tempo of the fight career. I was like, yeah, you have a fight every other month or so. So I get a phone call and I'm training. That This is, we, you fight on Saturday, you're back to the gym on Monday training. As long as you're not injured, that requires surgery. Even if you're cut, you're back to the gym on Monday. And that's what I knew. And also I had to be back because I was using GI Bill to go to school to pay for me to train. So I had to be back on Monday because I had to go to school at 8 a.m. on Monday morning. So right. either way, it's, and that's just became the tempo. At the end of the fight, we always come back. So I come back, I'm training, and then we get a last minute phone call. And my coach, he's a little bit tipsy. He's excited. He's like, hey, how do you feel about fighting for the Bantamweight Championship of the world? I'm like, are you drunk? <laughs> he's like, I'm, I've had a few, but do you want to do that? I'm like, are you messing with me right now? He's like, no. Strike Force called. Uh, Misha Tate had, fell out of the fight. So, and it's last minute. It's nine days away. Do you want to take the fight? So nine days to prepare for a championship fight against a woman that's been fighting professionally for 11 years. She had a Muay Thai um, lineage and she had been winning there in championship belt. She's a brown belt in jiu-jitsu. I'm barely a white belt. I've just been right. doing this for, I think at that point, it was August of 2010. So I've been doing this for eight months, Oof. training for eight months. Right? So I'm brand new, but I'm like, yeah. Do you think I can do it? It's like, yes. I'm like, okay, I'll do it. Yeah. So I'm stoked. And then there I am. And that's like Saturday night or Sunday night, Monday, back into it training nine days later, I fight for the belt. Um, I ended up losing that fight, but, um, I took her, I took her almost a distance. We made it into the fourth round. Everybody had me as losing the fight, the first round within the first like 20 seconds, getting guillotined. Needless to say, even in the first 20 seconds, I got to do a takedown because I'm still learning, get caught yeah. in the guillotine. Thankfully, I'm strong as hell and stubborn. So I smash her to the ground and pop my head out. And then just proceed to just ground a pounder for every single round. That's just over and over every round. She's hitting me in the face. My coach is like, move your head. I'm like, it doesn't hurt. It's fine. Just keep walking through the punches, Dang. take her down, <laughs> ground a pounder out. Um, but because of that, everybody, like all, everybody had me so against the odds. And I came back and I did so in a fashion where like had elbows been legal because in strike force women weren't allowed to elbow on the ground to the head of an right. opponent. Whereas we all know that's legal now. Had elbows been legal, it would have been a whole different fight. I would have would have won the fight. Up until a few years ago, I held between strike force and the UFC the most strikes ever landed to an opponent in a fight. Because it was just nonstop and the ref's like, Marlon, if you don't defend yourself, I'm gonna stop the fight, but he would never stop the fight. I was like this is like 200 punches. Am I just going to keep on going? All right, cool. Let's keep on going. Um, so and uh, what were but the, uh... lost a fight, but that like raised my stake in the respect that I had among the community. I went from being a nobody fighter to a name that was being spoken in households. And as far as strike force is concerned, now is a, a, a force to be reckoned with in a name that people started to know. And soon after that, the UFC bought out strike force. Strike force went away. Uh, women were a part of strike force, but at that time the UFC had said like, no, we're not doing women's MMA. We're not integrating them. We don't believe in it. Nothing in there. Thankfully, Rhonda had won the belt right before that took over. And so she had been Dana White and the UFC owner's ears, like trying to get the hype there and get the excitement. And then here you go. Here's this door. And here comes opportunity knocking when right. we're going to be into the UFC. And we hear all the rumors going around and Ronda Rousey is able to do that. Um, apparently the UFC called a whole bunch of women. And this is three years now that I've been fighting. Right. Uh, or as, actually, when I get the phone call, it's at the end of my two years that this opportunity, I think it was December is when I, when I got this opportunity, but they start asking all the women, all the top women in the world, all the top 10 at this point. Now my first year fighting on, I've now been in the top 10 of women's MMA. So right. by beating, being that pioneer, I replaced her. I think she was number eight in the world. I replaced her as number eight by beating her. And then uh, fighting against Marla's and taking her into the fourth round raised my stake even more. So then here I am, and I'm like number two in the world out of nowhere or something crazy like that. And that I just stayed there for my entire fight career. I've maintained being in the top 10. Um, nice. That's 12 years running of doing that. But so they call all the women in the top 10 division. There's basically going down the list of like all the women have been strike boards. Like, hey, how do you feel about fighting Ronda Rousey to to be indoctrinated as the first fight in the UFC. No, thank you. Okay, hang up. Next person, hang up. 
experts. So, so of course, I wake up in the morning and I used to have this policy that I didn't touch my phone until 9 a.m. Even though I'm right. up, I'm up early in the morning, but I'm not touching my phone until 9 a.m. Nine to nine. That was my rule. 9 a.m., 9 p.m. and then it goes away. We don't touch it anymore. So I'm like looking at it, I'm like, why is my phone going off like crazy? I just see it lighting, pinging. I'm ignoring it. I'm like, everybody knows my role. This is super rude. And then like I noticed like, okay, my manager has now called me. My coach has called me. Oh, all right, something's going on. All right, so I answer the phone. Let me hit him up. <laughs> yeah, I answer the phone. And they're like, we've been trying to get a hold of you. What? Look, the UFC called. They want, want you to fight against Ronda Rousey. Do you want to take that fight? Yes, of course I do. Without hesitation. There's no no questions. Cool. And I'm like, oh, I always get in trouble. Because anytime a promoter would call me, they're like, hey, do you want to take this fight? I'm like, yeah, I'll fight. It's tomorrow. Okay, I'll be there. I'll, I'll, I'm on wait. I'm ready to go. And that was always the answer. And then my coaches eventually like, hey, now that you're in the top 10, we have to do things differently. You can't say yes to every single fight that comes around. Yeah, we got to do things smarter and try and work right. towards getting towards the belt. Um, so... I have to, then I'm like, oh, I need to call my coach back. And I was like, hey, he's like, did you get the phone call? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, are we taking it? I'm like, yes, I already said yes. He's like, okay, I thought so, because I told them yes too. I'm like, all right, cool. And then like <laughs> I hang up and the realization hits me like, oh, holy shit. Like I, this is the dream. This is everything I've dreamt about. Like once I got into Strike Force, this, I want to be the first woman to fight in the UFC. And oh my God, I'm going to be the first woman to fight in the UFC. And it's kind of like the, that is huge. Okay. How many? Okay. Well, I got to go to training and I got to train like it's a normal day. It can't be any different than it has been. And my usual routine is I go to strength and conditioning at 9 a.m., jiu jitsu at 10 a.m., pro practice at 11 a.m. Let's just go, go through the same motions and the same routine. So I just go into the gym and and then the stakes were so much higher than anything I could, I could have expected. One, like to me, every training session was imperative. I couldn't make mistakes. Everything right. had to be precise and it had to be towards this end goal of like getting that belt i wanted to win that belt but what i didn't anticipate is with that also came the ufc and that means like there's a there's a pr tour there's a media hours that you have to give every day and so like hey we need how many hours can you give a day to do media I'm like what do you mean like we well, to go to radio stations to go to television stations to do interviews on your phone to do facetime to I'm like um how i'm like okay well what's your training schedule i tell my training schedule, and they're like okay what's your work schedule I'm like i go to work an hour after i'm done training and then i also well at work at some points train too like okay well we need at least two hours from me every day i'm like i don't know how i'm gonna shave off two hours but yeah, okay yeah, yeah. you know and that's just like something i wasn't ready for which has set me up successfully since then so then it's a matter of you know, like, oh, I'm really thankful that while I was in strike force, I had the opportunity that I was going to college full time. And so all the classes that I did, I geared there was towards one, my schedule was for MMA. I made sure that every morning my schedule, I had planned out my schedule that would make sure and ensure that I could get to every practice every single day. And I made sure that I briefed every instructor like, hey, by the way, my job kind of takes me out of state from time to time. And I know we're not supposed to do that in California, but are you cool with that? And then it explains to them like, I do MMA. I'm not an idiot. So please work with me. Like, and they're like, okay, this is like a hobby. I'm like, no, like I, I'm a professional. I'm, I'm, I'm ranked as top in the entire world. I'm not, this isn't just like a hobby. Like this is a real thing. And then of course they look me up like, oh yeah, you can go away for this stuff. That's fine. Just make your eternal assignments. So then those classes are geared towards like, I am taking um, speech and debate classes, public speaking classes. And I'm like, well, if I'm going to, be in college, I don't really want to do college. I might as well use the system for what's going to help me. So right. I took public speaking classes, which helped getting in front of people because the UFC, they don't really give you any preparation for it. I think the kind of the hopes are is that you understand that there's a big responsibility in coming to the UFC. So you're going to do your due diligence to prepare, educate yourself and get ready for what it's about to come because you're going to be put on a stadium in front of everybody and have to answer questions in front of thousands of people and millions of people are going to come to see you. Right. And so I prep myself for strike force and that in turn prepped me for the UFC and it ends up paying off. So now that you're going, you know, you, you've, you've transitioned, you know, you're, you, you've already had your fights. You're going into the UFC, like, that just that brand UFC, you 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 hear about all these other women that are turning down the fights. 
like when you get those bright like when you walk into that arena like did you walk in first or did she walk in first i walked in first so technically i was the first woman in the ufc <laughs> hey you know the 10 toes down you know what I'm saying? so as you're walking in what like what is that like is your adrenaline going crazy are you like starting to breathe heavy because you can't process you see the lights you hear the cheers maybe some booze <laughs> You can hear people like drinking their freaking uh, their soda over here. Someone's got a beer over there. Like, what is that? What is that feeling like? Yeah. So with all my my pro fights and like I said, being in Strike Force and having like, I would say that Marlos Conan being that she was a champion that set me to an understanding of what to anticipate with UFC. Because in like every UFC fight is like that one big fight in Strike Force. Um, as far as like you're having panel questions, you having to go to all these media obligations. But that helps set a precedent to UFC, at least into what I had at least an iota of an understanding of what I was getting myself into. It was not even close to it, but at least I understood. So I had already gone through like the experience of when I'm in the cage, I had tunnel vision. I couldn't see anything outside the cage. I couldn't hear anybody. It was always just that focus on my opponent, listening to my coaches, tuning into them. So all mentally all day i basically try and turn my brain off for the fight because i get adrenaline rushes i start to picture the fight and i'm getting hyped up i'm sweating i'm excited i'm getting all ready to go and then it's the adrenaline dump and the adrenaline rush and the adrenaline dump so all day it's just just stay level-headed liz just stay calm the entire day uh and the same thing for this fight like i was trying so desperately especially because every interview you did was like how do you feel about making history how do you feel about doing this you know like Oh, this is a lot more pressure than I was expecting. Like, yeah, can we just not talk <laughs> about that? You know, like every time you have a training partner that comes out and wants to help you, they're they're wanting to help be a part of history and want to be a name that that's announced and stuff. So you start to realize just the depth and the weight of the pressure that's being put on you. And so everything I wanted to do was just to go out there and put on the best performance. So I'm like, please just don't go out there and freeze. Don't be an idiot, Liz. Just go out there and be the best you. Get that freaking belt just don't don't freeze don't mess up and as i'm backstage i'm just like i've already gone through all these emotions of trying not to picture the fight and getting an adrenaline increase and rush to a dump to by the time that i get backstage i'm exhausted because i've had this all these emotional and energy dumps and, and blasts that my body is like yeah you've pretty much done like 10 fights we're we're toast just chill out so i'm like backstage like i'm ready to take a nap and that's not good yeah <laughs> <laughs> but the moment that they're like all right you're ready to go it's your turn and we walk out there burt watson is probably the best hype man um he is always known as like the backstage the man behind the scenes running the ufc and he's he's notorious for going out there and saying we're ready we're ready we're rolling screaming at the top of his lungs he walks you out to um to the pathway to the entryway they pull back the curtains and then you go down into the stadium and you take that walkway through the fans overhead he's the one that gets you there so he's getting you all hyped up and you're like okay i'm back in this my energy is there i'm ready to go yeah. you get there and i to this day have never experienced a fight there i get to the threshold the curtains are closed and i can feel the energy of the stadium the enthusiasm the anxiousness for us to perform the excitement about seeing something that's never happened before without even knowing how many people are in the stadium and that it was sold out because i didn't know it at that time i could feel that it was sold out i could feel all the people in there it was electric the energy and the field of the people there the enthusiasm the the want to see something happen that's never uh, occurred before and then when they pull it back the lights the flicker the um, the dramatic way that the ufc does everything backstage is different than other places and then you go out there and people are touching you they're grabbing on you as you're walking out there and i'm just trying to get tunnel vision i'm just like just focus just go there just get to the cage i'm trying to walk through everybody not see anybody not touch anybody but just focus on what it was that i was going out there for but i'm also like feeling like i'm walking on the energy of the people it's, it's electric it's carrying me out there uh, get out there. I see my mom in the crowd. This is the last thing I want to do because I can just see the fear because she's just has always been like, I don't want you to fight. I don't believe in fighting and violence. And I'm here to support you because I believe in you, but I am not for this stuff. And I could just like, I'm like, I feel your energy too, mom. This is good. <laughs> <Knock it off. laughs> not the eyes that I thought was going to be like right there. Um, but get in there. 
And it was just, just even every moment of that fight, every punch that was thrown, you could feel like the fans invested in not really picking a fighter. I mean, I would say at that time it's kind of 50, 50. They want to run to the stand her streak as, as being this judokin that arm bars everybody, but they also want to see this underdog that's had this story told that's coming out of nowhere and it's helping make this, this possible, this Marine. And so the, the energy is split, but then really the fans start to be about the experience of the fight. And you can see like when I have her back, everybody's like, go Liz. And it's completely not, no Rhonda. And then she shakes about this, go Rhonda. And yeah, so it's yeah. like constantly this fighting energy going back and forth. But what it co completely always was, was enthusiasm for women fighting and everybody on their feet, ready to see it go down. And that never changed from beginning to the end of the fight. But that energy is still something to this day I've never experienced. God, that is incredible. Just the way you describe all that. I'm seeing all the flashes right now. Just because, <laughs> ah, man, to be able to see all of these people and then you just zone in on your mom. It's like, mom, why, why, are, you, why are you right there? Hold <laughs> up, like, why in the crowd somewhere? <laughs> so going from this fight, like the, the experience that you, <clears throat> my apologies. The experience that you got from this fight, carrying you all the way to your latest fight, which was just a few months ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you fought, was that the Juliana Velasquez fight? Yeah. And uh, you got something from it, right? I did. <laughs> you, you, became, you became a champion in that division, which is the flyweight division. Yes. And I'm going to be honest, like, I know you ain't supposed to ask a woman their weight. I never knew what, like, weight you were. I could look at you and go... You have zero body fat, but like I, I never knew because you were, your muscles were like ridiculous, uh, but you weren't like, like big because yeah, like I said, you had no body fat. But so when I looked yeah. up what flyweight was, and and flyweight is one fifteen to one twenty five, right? Yeah, one twenty five, typically one twenty five. Yeah. How is that even possible? Do you know what it would take for possible, me to get the one twenty five? Do wait, do men don't have that right, or they do? It's a different. No, no, they have a 125 for men too. They are shredded, shredded. How? 125? You got to think, 125 is pretty popular in Japan and in Thailand. My legs weigh like, more than 125. But then you have some guys that just like never break the height. Like I would say one of my friends, two of my friends, former wrestlers. And so while their bodies were still developing, they were wrestling, cutting weight, putting their body through. So I honestly feel like that worked against them to never like truly hit their growth spurts. Cause one of them, he has like his brother and his cousins who didn't wrestle and they're all giants. So it's like, right. you probably would have been tall had you not wrestled. And then you like have my friend where like, yeah, he and his sisters and his moms are all the same height, but he's a guy he probably would have been taller. So I feel like that works against him. But he, he walks around at like 135 and fights at 125. And this is eating candy and junk, like horrible diet at 135. Call him out. Like, <laughs> so when he cleans up his diet, he's exactly on weight. Um, but in the Marine Corps, no, like my first, my, so my first deployment, I really had a misconception of what our role was going to be going out there. I right. just knew that I was like, I'm never going to be, be the weak link. I want to make sure that if anybody ever gets injured, if uh, an IED goes off anything, I want to be able to carry anybody back to a place of safety and protect them. So that means anybody, any size, I can't be the weakest link where I can't carry somebody. So my whole goal in my first deployment was to put on as much muscle as possible. I put on like 25 pounds on Iraq. So I want to say that I guess 28 pounds because 150 was the maximum weight. So I was 178 coming back. Then the second deployment was, once I understood, was to see how light I could get. And at that point, it was 138, but it was super unhealthy. I didn't, yeah. I had no idea how to like do the small thing. I was like, I'm eating lettuce all the time. This should be okay. And it's horrible. Running like 12 miles a day. Uh, it's disgusting. Um, so I definitely went through like two different things trying to figure out what was going to work for me. My third deployment was really when I got that MMA mindset and understanding how to train and eat for training to sustain training to be healthy. And there's a different way to do things. And I would say that was the healthiest I was, the leanest, but with the most muscle. So it was kind of a mixture of my first and my second deployment, but the best way to do it. Um, right. And so like my first deployment made me think like, I'm going to be a, a 155 or a 145, or I'm going to be big and I'm going to be strong. And then I met 145 as well. I was like, yeah, I'm not that tall. I'm not a 145. Even the 135ers. <laughs> 
I was, other than Jessica and Draj, she ran into the same issue where we are both. Because when we started in the UFC, the only weight class that was available for a while was just the 135 division. And then the 135 then added 145 and then another 115. 125 was the last division for them to add. So I'm like, I know I'm too small to go 115. So I'm just going to stay at 135. Right. And when I thought, when I fought Jessica Andrade, she was drinking soda and fully dressed when she weighed in. So that's just an idea of like how much she was not, there was, mind you, there's, there's cutting weight. I wouldn't say is, ne is necessary. Like if you're doing it right, you shouldn't be cutting weight, but you also shouldn't be drinking soda at weigh-ins and fully yeah. clothes. You know what I mean? Like it should be like, I put my clothes on, I gained a few pounds. Not like I'm fully dressed at 135. <laughs> right. At 134. Uh, and she was the smallest person I'd ever fought at 135. She was, I think, two inches shorter than I was. Prior to that, everybody, and there's only been two fights in the entirety of my whole fight career where I've ever fought somebody shorter than me. Jessica Andrade and Vanessa Porto. Other than that, everybody else has been taller than me. Yeah, that's, I mean, like I said, it's, I knew the male Marines that were like intimidated by you. You know what I'm saying? I knew there were a lot of people that when it was time to get on that mat, they didn't want that smoke. <laughs> and taller than you, shorter than you, same size as you, it didn't matter. Like that's, um, it was obvious, uh, you know, you could just tell by the way you trained and how, you know, how much time you dedicated to that, that um, you were a force to be reckoned with. And when I heard you were gonna go into fighting, I was like, oh yeah. I, <laughs> 200 right there 2000 whatever you want <laughs> it's on her <laughs> um oh so i was saying is like so going from your you know the first fight that you had in ufc to your your, your most recent fight i know you talked about the different uh, the different experiences that you kind of gained along the way um we we started by the the initial portion of the ufc the lights you know what i'm saying the, the the adrenaline the thing the different things that you feel while going into battle um, going from that, which, you know, you talked about, um, not, I mean, it being a successful fight in its own mind, uh, but not being able to, to, to take your streak away yep. to your most recent fight, which how long of a gap was that in between? That was like, so the fight with Rondo was February of 2013 13. until April, 2022. So a nine year gap, um, you know, where you are to me a great component of saying like it's not it doesn't have to be over if that's what you want to do yeah that's a that's a huge gap i mean think about all the all the fighters that have come and gone and they usually have their like three sometimes four year kind of like yeah uh peak that they have and then afterwards a lot of the fighters unfortunately they can't compete at that level any longer and you know and here you are still you know um extremely relevant like you said always in the top 10 um, usually in the upper half and then, you know, uh, winning a fight for you to become a champion in a, in a division. What was that like? Um, I mean, the passion for MMA um, is what really drove all of this. The the lessons on how to recover to stay in it um, and nutrition are really the key components that had to work into it because I really didn't understand. I mean, in the beginning, like I said, I couldn't afford to eat the things that I needed to to take care of my body. And then I didn't understand nutrition. Um, I didn't really, wasn't feeling my body for it needed. I couldn't afford to do the recovery, let alone did I think it was that important. Like I didn't stretch, I didn't do massages, chiropractic, acupuncture, you name in anything that you can possibly think to do recovery. There wasn't a single thing that I was doing to do it. Uh, and as I started to understand, like if I wanna stay in this sport, it's more expensive for me to pay for a surgery than it is to do all this recovery stuff year round it would be smarter for me to do all this recovery stuff and stay in the sport than compromise and take time off and lose all my money by doing a surgery. So I'd rather not do that anymore. But me staying relevant and staying in the, in the top 10 is always just because I love MMA and I'm passionate about it. You know, it's really easy for me to go, go to the gym and train on Monday. It's not like people talk about finding that motivation. Like how do you stay motivated? My motivation is that kid that just turned 18 is going pro that started training at four and has been training longer than I have. And I've been a pro for 12 years. Like they have, they've been doing it for 14 years and they're young. They've never had an injury and they're hungry and they're, and they know more methods and they have more methodology than I have. Like I'm just now really getting into judo and wrestling. These, one of these kids that I know who's about to, who's going pro in MMA 
uh, already has a black belt in judo, already has a black belt in jiu-jitsu, has been doing boxing and doing Muay Thai. I stand no chance with them. Thankfully, it's a it's a 18 year old boy and not a woman because God knows what would happen if that happened. But <laughs> that that's what I would always have to realize is that my the reason I can go to the gym every day is one because I love learning and there's, there's always something new to learn and something new to adapt. And, and like I tell people, if you're in a sport and you think that you've already reached the pinnacle of everything, and you think you know it all, quit. Yep. Quit. It's too late. It's too late. There's never a day like I just did a two days a catch wrestling seminar. There's always something to learn and adapt into the game. And if you don't think so, you shouldn't be doing this. You've lost that fire. And if nothing else, realize there is a young person that has more experience and is healthier than you that's ready to take your place if you're not hungry to keep it. And I have mouths to feed. I have a wife and I have a son. I have mouths to feed. I'm not letting that 18 year old kid take my paycheck and take right. that belt for me. So it's really easy for me to to continue going in there every day. And still training six to seven days a week, just like I did when I started. That is amazing. That's, and you're right. As soon as you get complacent, that's usually when it yep. happens. You get comfortable. That's why they always talk about a lot of people, like why it was so impressive for, uh, I don't know if he still has the record for Anderson Silva to defend the belt as many times as he did. Because yeah. a lot of champions, when they get the belt, it's like, okay, I reached my goal. Yep. You know, and a lot of people, I mean, I don't know what the, the numbers are after that. I think like, um, I don't know if it was just the middle uh, middleweight, but I know Israel did it like four times. Um, but not too many people have be, uh, gone over four or five times of defending mm -hmm. the belt without losing it. Uh, so that's definitely something that you got the underdog coming for you. You've yeah. already gotten to where you got, and this guy's starving or females starving down here, ready to take what you got. Yep. So yeah, I mean, I was I was contacting belts or not soon after I got back, and I'm like, hey, when can I get a fight again? I'm ready. Book me for a fight. So it's really just at this at this point, it's just on them to to book the fight. But it's all I'm ready. Like I I'm, I'm not looking to sit on this belt and just just coast on it. No, I want to get as many title defenses as my body doesn't allow me to. So let's start racking it up. Let's go. That's incredible. So damn, you are a beast. When you uh, so when you when you get a title, do you get like bonuses for defending, or do you get bonuses for attaining a title? Not for obtaining a title. No. So like everything. And, and everybody's contract is different. Just my my previous management, the way that they worked the contract, basically winning the title, really all it brought was a title and a belt. And that was it. Uh, pay difference, nothing like that. Really, the title defenses, successfully defending titles is when you start to see the, those pay differences and hopefully more sponsors that want to jump on board and endorse Medills. But just that achievement was just that. It was just achievement. And all it means is somebody's hungry, knocking at my door, waiting to take it from me. To, to have that mindset is to me a, a direct reflection of why you've been successful and why you've been able to do this so much over time. And uh, that definitely needs to be applauded because I, I've seen you with an incredible work ethic since the, you know, the day that I met you, uh, I knew that you were different. You stuck out amongst other people. Um, and that, that's absolutely amazing. A lot of people can't do what you do. You know, I know you know this already, but no matter how much they try, no matter how much somebody motivated them, no matter how many, how many times, you know, they listen to the rock and motivation videos, they, they, they're not going to get up six to seven times a week for six hours a day of training, slaying your body, being sore every day, knees cracking, ankles cracking as soon as you wake <laughs> up, you know what I'm saying? It's, uh, that's that popping motion, whatever. That's absolutely incredible. And that's definitely something to, uh, to be proud of. Um, and, and outside of, uh, of fighting in the military, I know a little bit, we talked about your, uh, your Liberty Buddies, um, uh, foundation. Do, do you mind, uh, kind of hitting on that a little bit? Because I think it's a kind of tie in the, the whole, the total person of who you are. Um, I kind of want to see if we can brief on this a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, into, I think maybe my, my second year into my second year fighting the UFC, I got an injury and it benched me for a little bit. Um, and then trying to like, once I got injured and I tried to contact the UFC, like, Hey, I'm ready to go again. It, it just got getting postponed. So I was just sitting on the bench. I was just in my head because up until that point, I, I got so used to fighting frequently in a year that that's, that was enough motivation is knowing that Monday morning I'm helping other training partners get ready. And I got another fight around the corner. Somebody's calling me to set it up, but I was under contract with the UFC, UFC. So if they said, we don't have anything for you, that means you just sit and wait. Um, 
And so that was really difficult. I'd, I'd never done that before. Just like sit and wait. Like, no, there's, there's something I'm working for. Um, and so I started getting depressed and um, I wanted, I knew I wasn't in a good place and I needed to do something to get myself out of that rut. I was still training, but it just wasn't the same effort. And when I was home at night, I just wasn't in a good place. I was in a really dark place. So um, I reached out to one of my training partners because she said she was a dog trainer. And I was like, hey, would it be possible? Because like, I love animals and like, I may not be able to go out and be around people, but if I'm in a bad place, an animal, if I can help an animal, I always feel better. Right. And who doesn't want to hold like a dog and a puppy and like cuddle and stuff. So I, I just asked her, I was like, hey, could I, could I come help out with your dogs? Like I'll walk them, I'll pick up poop. Like, can I just like be around them? She's like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I just, it, you know, like I just, I haven't been around animals in a long time and I didn't want to bear down and, and like put any burden on her and tell her what I was going through or what I was feeling. I didn't know her that well. Um, so she let me come up and let me just walk the dogs, play with the dogs. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm feeling a bit better. And I think she started to see that I wasn't there just because I missed animals, that there was something else going on. Yeah. Um, and she kind of encouraged me. She's like, Hey, just noticing like you as some of our vets, you're very similar to our vets and that maybe a, a service dog would help you out and take you out of this rut and, and help you get through things. Like when was the last time you were like out in public and doing things? And I was like, yeah, I haven't done that in a while. I just go to work and I come back home. I don't, I don't really go out with people. Um, and so thankfully because of her, she's not my wife. Um, she got me involved with the, the service dog program. They connected me with the service dog. Um, and we saw, I saw how much the service dogs are touching lives. I saw what she was able to do because she wasn't just, connecting veterans um, that needed service dogs with a service dog. She was connecting with the veterans and checking in with them. And I felt like she went above and beyond and understanding what the veterans needed, not just with me, but with other veterans too. And, but we also saw that like, as the years went on and I got to see her as a dog trainer, as we started dating, we saw a lot of um, shady stuff that was going on with that particular service dog program. And then also just flaws that in the service dog, just training programs in general across the board, just flaws and gaps that were missing, that weren't hinging everything together to truly help the veterans. And one of the biggest things that we noticed was really just that some veterans having a service dog gets them out of that rut and then they grow and they better for it. Some people end up falling on their service dogs as a crutch. So then they can't do anything without their service dog. So if their service dog is sick, injured, or the temperament of its growth changes and it doesn't want to work, then this veterans at a, at a huge, huge disservice because they can't live the life that they want to live. And so right. what was at one point helping them has now become a crutch that they don't want. And as she talked to more of the veterans, they're like, I wish I didn't need my service dog anymore. So I, at some point asked her and I felt like I, I was able to provide enough. I said like, Hey, all this stuff going on at your job, the things that they're, they've done to you, the things that they're asking for you are, first of all, some of it's illegal <laughs> and, and yeah. two, you don't deserve to be going through this. If I can help take care of you and I can help provide for our son, Brand, if I can financially support us, would you quit your job? And like we talked about it back and forth, she decided like, yeah, it would work best if she could be here to, to raise my son full time um, and didn't have to like split the time and like all this other things, um, but still wanted to, to train dogs and still wanted to help out the veterans. And one night I was asking her, I was like, what do you want to do? Like, what do you, where do you see yourself going? What do you want to do with your life? She's like, well, I'd love to just train service dogs. And I was like, okay, well, like the way that you were before, she's like, no, that wasn't like, they weren't healthy dogs and it's great in theory, but in actual action, it just wasn't working. And so we talked out, we came up with a plan in a future and a, basically a mission statement for what she wanted to do. And I was like, okay, well, if we can figure out how to fund this, why don't you do that? your dreams are possible. Why not do it? You don't want to go back to school. You don't want to do this. You have something you're passionate about, something you're wonderful at. Why not do it? So we talked it through. And then uh, I'd say over the last two, three years, we've been scouring the nation to find the healthiest Labrador retrievers and golden retrievers. We do uh, hip testing, elbow testing, genetic testing, health testing to make sure they are the healthiest dogs possible. Because even one of the problems we found is like, you may get a dog, but nobody tests for health. There's very few service dog programs that do. And if they do, it's like 10% of possibility that could ail a dog instead of everything. Right. right. 
So you have a dog, they're like, okay, either they don't want to work, they're a great dog, but they're not a working dog. They don't want to have a job and do it. Or two, they have health issues. And so you have a dog that works and then in a few years, you're having to dole out tons of vet bills and taking them to a doctor all the time because now they're hurting. And so it's kind of the roles reversed and it's not benefiting anybody. We're like, well, right. why don't we find a dog that wants to work and loves to work and then is the healthiest dog that can work for instead of just like maybe two or three years, what if they can work for like eight to 10 years? And then after that, they get to keep the dog and it lives out its life for whether it's, it lives till it's 18 or however long with as healthy as our dogs are as possible. So we scoured the nation from the healthiest dogs possible. We right. started breeding uh, golden retrievers and laboratory retrievers. And then depending on the temperament of the veteran, we now have healthy puppies that based on their temperament and behavior, some of them will make it into the service dog program. Some of them won't, that just works out. All of them are great dogs, but of those, some of them are just too crazy and they're too high drive. They're like, I'm going to go all day long. And for some veterans, that's great. But for some veterans, that's not like, they're like, they need to have that off switch. Some right. of the puppies don't really have that off switch. So then you find an active person that wants them, but we're making a program now. And it's just in the beginning stages. We just had our first litter of eight puppies. Um, good great puppies i love them it's breaking my heart to like watch any of them go away because they become like my little babies oh, but our first set of puppies and we already have um two that are going to go to veterans um one is a veteran that reached out to us that lost their their dog passed away and so they need a new service dog so we're in like we have now what's a nine week old ten week old puppy that in about a year will be old enough to go to his veteran and be able to provide for him and what our ultimate goal is to provide a program where service members can help work through therapy programs, helping train these dogs that will then be able to partner with either another veteran that needs a dog full time or a child with autism that can benefit from a dog. Mm, that is a man. I, people are, you know, regardless of what the media displays, sometimes humans are amazing that you know there's a lot of selfless human beings on this earth those that truly want to see a change in this world and uh you know obviously you you're you've been affected by the veteran community because you you know you're a part of it and for you you know for you guys to do this man like to you know take your time foster these dogs uh until they're able to you know get pushed out tr help train and go out of your way to to look for dogs that are, are going to get the longest lifespan by looking at their health history and finding specific dogs to specific veterans for what they need the most that is absolutely incredible that is absolutely incredible I, man i ain't gonna lie i would love to have a service dog those, those <laughs> uh, just another companion yeah loyal loyal by nature you know and yep. i was gonna be by your side when you need something yeah and she um i mean she we had uh a golden retriever that there was a veteran and his his dog didn't work out. He was involved in the program before that we talked about. Uh, like I'm not trying to throw people's under the bus, but like I said, not the best. And um, he had reached out to her brother who surprised, amusingly enough, there's a four year difference. My, my wife's the youngest of six okay. and her older brother is a Navy veteran. And he ended up following in her footsteps and got into dog training after her. Feel like her encouragement so she's kind of the mentor and that same same as like the we're similar in that way like the younger siblings kind of help teach us yeah <laughs> um good. but he'd reached out to her just saying because he knew that she was involved in the service members and training service dogs um and had reached out to her saying like hey do you know somebody to be able to help out or can you help out and so she spent two years training this dog to help this veteran and he had probably the most needs of any Anybody that we've ever seen, he had seizures because of the getting blown up in Iraq um, that would make him incoherent and not. And when he would come to, sometimes he'd wander off in that incoherent state, not remember his name, not know where he, he was at. And he got like miles away and was in a hospital, but couldn't tell people what was going on with him. He also didn't feel comfortable going into a room. So he needed a dog that could go in and clear a room from a dog that could alert before he had a seizure that if he did have a seizure, alert other people, but stay with him. And so that, that's a lot to ask, but she successfully trained this dog for two years to go right. and that's that program. But it was her first time, like one training it for all these needs is more than, than most, most veterans need, but also the first time completely doing it on her own with a dog that she ventured out, found it with all the health needs. And it was like her first one successful, the program under delivery buddies. That 
That's so incredible. That is so incredible, man. To, like I said, to have people around that, that care. I mean, that's a lot of dedication. Two years, food, time, training, patience, all yeah. things that go into, you know, to that skill of dog training. And then now you're talking about for a specific uh, need. Uh, that, that is absolutely incredible. So, so where can everybody find, like, like if, if this is something like a program that someone, you know, feels that they either qualify for or something that might assist them, how can they, uh, how can they find Liberty, uh, Liberty Buddies? Yeah, they look up uh, my wife on social media, um, on Instagram. That's kind of where she's starting off right now, showing people one, just the puppies that are part of the program, starting to spread that word. Our next step in this is to start setting out applications for people to see who's eligible to, um, to, and who would benefit most from having these service dogs to start. Because when we train these service dogs, it's not gen generically with what a dog is, but it's done specifically for the veterans. So when we have a puppy, it's going to be set for them and all of their needs from birth. Mm. So it's, it's a real application process to make sure that we have the right dog for them. Uh, but right now, if they just reach out to her on Instagram, uh, I think she's Bray, B-R-A-E dot Chapman on Instagram. They can find her, reach out, and then uh, she'll screen them set out certain questions and be able to see what the next step is for him. All right. And uh, what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll make sure like all you guys, the social media is down in the uh, description down below Perfect. as well. So for those of you guys that do want to check that out, or you figure that's a, a program that's going to best suit you or somebody that, you know, just go ahead and look down in the description down below and we'll make sure we have a link for that. Um, did you want to, you know, let, uh, listen, you're well known. A lot of people know who you are, but did you want to let people know where they can follow you at where, you know, where you would prefer they follow you at? Yeah, I'm on Instagram as I am Gorilla. Same on Twitter. I'm almost never on Twitter. Uh, and then Facebook as Liz Carmouche Official. And once again, we'll put those in the description down below. Uh, and for those of you guys that haven't already done so, make sure you guys check out Veteran Influencers, Veteran underscore Influencers. If you guys want uh, one of the shirts for my new line, my signature series, I'll be creating a bunch of new designs for you guys to sport. I've been getting hit up a lot about it, so I decided to step my game back up, create these damn designs out because you guys love it. So um liz it has been an absolute pleasure honestly like your first of all your ear interviewing ability now i know you went to school for it uh <laughs> but you didn't have to show me up the way now <laughs> <laughs> absolute quality I, I wouldn't expect nothing less than that from someone like you so i i appreciate Thank the you. hell out of you i know we originally i reached out to you like i'll look at those text messages it was like a year ago <laughs> i didn't think it was that long but my time has just been all connected. I was thinking like three, four months ago. I'm looking at it, there's no way it was a year and a half. So uh, I apologize for not uh, doing my due diligence to get back. I know oh, we're no looking at new webcam and stuff. And so my, that's my fault right there. No, no problem whatsoever. And uh, yeah, it was definitely great catching up to you. And I'll catch up to you after this. But uh, is there anything else you want to say to the people? No, just saying uh, tune in to Bellator. I'm looking to keep pushing. Uh, I think that Kana Watanabe deserved a rematch. Uh, for me, if you're going to fight for the championship, you want to be a contender. It needs to be done off a win, not a loss to be able to deserve it. And she just beat out in really impressionable fashion Denise Kilholtz. So I think that she's the one that should be the next to fight for the belt. So I want to see everybody push for that and let's see if we can do it in Japan too. Hey, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, Liz, I appreciate it. I'll catch you off this. Peace out, everybody. I appreciate y'all.